Well, I got one question that was sent to me, and I'll deal with that question first, and then I will do the other thing I've provided because I know that that one question will not be sufficient or I have to dismiss you five minutes after I deal with that and I don't want to do that. I love you so much I want to have you here for an hour. Literally, I mean that. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to find the question. Okay. The question is, can you help me understand what John 10, 15 through 16 mean? Some people I know are trying to use this scripture to establish that other groups, that is the nation of Islam, Hinduism, and on and on, are or will be or may be going to heaven. Um, let's is the question clear to everybody? Okay, but let's read John chapter 10 the gospel of John chapter 10 and I think we should read it in context so because it's important to read it in context I'm going to read it so that you all can get the context. So we'll read. We'll start with verse 7. Uh, if you don't have the Bible with you, if you don't have your Bible with you, you can look on the screen and I believe they will have it there for you. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Amen. So the basic question is, what did Jesus mean? in verses 15 and 16. And in order for us to understand that, we have to read it in context. Um, most of you know that I teach uh, pastors uh, exegesis, that's how to interpret the Bible. I teach Greek and Hebrew. 
And uh, I have to really caution preachers that whenever you see a passage of scripture and you're reading it out of context, you can actually make a passage say anything you want it to say. And sometimes a lot of preachers are concerned about even words and looking at words and looking at the meaning of words. And words themselves don't have meaning. They only have meaning in the context that they are in. So you can use a word and you can use it several ways and it can mean several things, but it's still the same word. So if you have to look in the context that the word is in, and not only that, but when you have a verse of scripture, you cannot interpret it out of context. You always have to look at it in context to see what it is saying to you. So if you don't look at this in context, you can talk about extraterrestrial beings. Who knows what he's talking about? The sheep that is from Venus or some other planet. Okay, so it's really important then to look and say, who is Jesus talking about in this particular passage? It is very obvious if you look at it in context, not just only in this particular chapter, but look at the whole book of John. So if you're looking at the whole book of John, specifically Jesus, when he said, my sheep, he was basically referring to the Jews. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall anyone be able to snatch them out of my hands. Today, it is really difficult for us to understand the concept that in the early days, it was not unheard of to see a Jew becoming a follower of Jesus. In fact, in the early days, 99% of those who followed Jesus were Jews. And sometime you remember at one point there was uh, a woman that came to Jesus and wanted Jesus to help her. And, you know, and Jesus said, why should I take food that is given to the children and give it to dogs? And to that, for us, that would sound very, very, you know, insulting or whatever. But the point there was that Jesus was sent specifically to make sure that the Jews accepted because they were called the chosen people of God. Out of all, if you read the Old Testament, all of the message of the Old Testament is that the Jews were a special people. God chose them to be his people. So when Jesus came, the same thing went on. But Jesus, of course, changed the story. Jesus basically said, especially if you look at anywhere from this passage and culminating in John chapter 14 when he proclaimed that he was the way for everybody. And then in what we call the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses uh, 19 and 20. So we see in here that Today, it's very difficult for you to get a Jew to become a Christian. So we really won't understand this. We're not looking at it in context. In context, in those days, it was very difficult for a Gentile to be a Christian. It was very rare. So that when Gentiles became, in fact, uh, you remember Cornelius and the story of, you know, yeah, Acts 10. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scholar. <laughs> Uh, th that, was, that was a very difficult thing. Even for Jews, it was very difficult for them to believe that a Gentile can become a member of the house of God. To the point where they will even quote the Old Testament to support their assertions. So in this passage, Jesus is basically talking and he's saying to them, yes, I'm called to the lost house of Israel. Other sheep. 
that are not yet in this fold, they too will come in. So he's not talking about Iran or Iraq. Uh, he's not talking about Muslims. He's not talking about Buddhists. He's not talking about, you know, uh, Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> he's basically here saying, I have other sheep. The only proper interpretation based on the context will be Gentiles. Yes. Well, I, I think Jesus used a lot of uh, what they would call in their day. You have to understand that when they're speaking, they're speaking to people who understood the culture. Okay? When other people are reading it, they will, you know, find something offensive or something. But to them, it was not offensive. Remember that... Uh, the answer of the lady to Jesus was not, how in the world can you say that? Okay? The context is very simple. We don't have to complicate it. It's just, it was a saying at that time that was understood by everybody. Okay? In other words, you cannot give something that does not belong to somebody else to them. Okay? So it was a saying, it was a natural saying. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't get that in the video, in the thing? Okay. Well, they would just think I'm making things up as I go, so that's okay. We'll confuse them. <laughs> okay. So basically in the context of that, it's just basically saying, no, we cannot give something to those uh, that it doesn't belong to. At this point, this thing belongs to these people. And we should give it to them. Of course, the conversation did not end there. The conversation, well, at least let the dog stick walk in from the crumbs of the table, you know, and eat, you know. And, of course, that was an amazing response. As far as Jesus was concerned, is, hey, you're right on, woman. You're, you're right. That's, that's exactly uh, the best answer to that. So, regardless of what, uh, even when Jesus sent his disciples out, remember, he said, you go to these specific places. You know, you have to do it. And I think sometimes it, it may sound strange to us, but it's not strange when you're trying to start something. We won't be here today if it wasn't for the strategy that Jesus used. You know, it would have been very difficult. But... Uh, yeah, to the person that asked that question, is that clear? You don't have to say your name, you know. But if it's not clear, if there's a follow-up question to that particular passage, any follow-up question? Or any follow-up question to the follow-up question? Yes. Remember, this is question and answer Sunday. Other Sundays when I'm preaching, you can't stop me and ask questions. But today you can ask any question you want. Yes. But Pastor, you're not saying that there's there isn't hope for those who are of the other religion, the Muslim, the Jehovah, because should they come into the knowledge and truth of who Jesus Christ really is and they get saved, then can they then be part of that those other sheep that he's referring to? Thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Our gospel, the gospel that we preach, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is not geographical. It's not nationalistic. It is not tribal. Uh, in fact, the word that is used, the Greek word ethne, uh, refers to the whole creation, the whole world, the, the, the others, uh, you know, uh, um, and yes, the, the answer to your question is yes. It does include everybody. It does include Muslims. It does include Buddhists. It does include Jehovah Witnesses. It does include anyone that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. But what it's saying is it's limited to those 
who are going to accept me as Lord and Savior, they're going to be part of this. It is not an interfaith message. Amen. It is not saying that it doesn't matter what religion you have, that you're going to go into heaven. What it's saying is that it doesn't matter where you're coming from, but if you come through the right gate, you're going to be in the ship pen. So, so uh, I don't want us to go out and say uh, Muslims are going to hell, uh, Buddhists are going to hell, uh, Jewish people are going to hell. You know, that's it's, you might as well say Christians are going to hell too. Okay, because the people who don't go to hell are the people who have accepted the substitutionary atonement of Jesus on the cross for us. Amen. If you have not, you can go to church for a hundred years and still go to hell. Amen. In fact, you can be a preacher and still go to hell. The people who go to heaven are the ones who uh, obey the words of scripture. In, in, John, um, uh, in John chapter 14, uh, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So there are three definite articles that were used in there. Okay. In Greek, there is no indefinite article. That's why when the Jehovah Witnesses said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God, they were wrong. Because they supply that indefinite article which is not in the Greek. But when the Greek uses the definite article, it is important to note it. So when Jesus said, I am the way, he meant other ways are excluded. I am the life. You know, no one comes to the Father except by me. So he was very serious about that. Okay? And that is why it is important for us to understand that if you have a friend, if you have uh, uh, someone in your family who is a black Muslim or uh, whatever faith they are, it's always really important for you to try to convert them. I mean, don't be a nuisance. Don't be a problem. But at the same time, you need to do everything you can to win people to Christ because if there's only one way, you better know. If, if Safeway is the only st grocery store, you got to find, figure out how to get your way there, right? You know, so it's, it's the same thing. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am one of the ways. Yes, Joanna. So kind of along those same lines, I ran into an old friend from church who's now become a Jehovah's Witness. So I'm just wondering what would make someone um, go from being a Christian to Jehovah's Witness? Like what was said to her along the way? Oh, wow. You want me to be here for two hours? <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering just some background before I meet with her, just to okay. kind of know where her thinking is at. Yes. Let me, what we do here is not done in a lot of churches, okay? Because a long time ago, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, I started this question and answer Sunday where there's, I just feel that what has happened in the church for a long time is that we begin to develop illiterate Christians. Some of them have PhD in mathematics, but they're still illiterate when it comes to Christianity. Uh, there are a lot of churches that are not teaching people the Bible. 
you will be amazed what people that are sitting next to you, not, not your husband, <laughs> the people that are sitting next to you in the church don't know. And it's because we are not taught. I put it this way, and it's not original with me, but many churches have fire but no light. You can, you know, that preacher will, just like me, you know, I, I get loud when I'm preaching and all that, you know, get all excited and everything, giving you a lot of things that make you feel good. But there's no teaching. So there are a lot of people who are in the church, they come here day after day, day uh, week after week, you know, but they still don't know what the gospel is. They don't know what the Bible teaches. So when they meet somebody who influences them and says something that sounds really convincing, Amen. here they are, they go. That is why the Bible says, I will give them a shepherd that is after my own heart yes, to teach them. Yes, and if you even look at the Great Commission, it says what? Go ye all into the world and... Wait a minute. Let somebody that knows it, please stand and quote it for me. The Great Commission. You you don't want me to say you see? Okay, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is the great commission, right? Making disciples, teaching them to observe everything. I have commanded you, teaching them to observe. I've held classes here on just about every subject in the world. And if we hold classes, you see how many people show up? So don't be surprised that you have somebody that's been in the church for years, years, and still don't know what it is. If you go into a church and you ask somebody, can you stand up and tell me about the Trinity for five minutes? Mm. I wonder how many of us here can present the Trinity for five minutes. Five minutes. Not 10, not 20, not 30, but five minutes. Say it clearly what the Trinity is. You see, some people in the church still refer to the Holy Spirit as it. In fact, most of the songs that many of you listen to are devoid of any theological content. You just like the beat, you know? Oh, it sounds good. But sometimes it's corrupting your mind because it's given to you theological fallacy that you should not be following. Come into your car and you playing that music, and I said, "Man, why are you playing that music? It's gospel." No, it's not. So it is important. Christian education is important. The Bible says it's important. Preaching is not about getting you excited. It's about teaching you the things that God has given to us so that you can follow it. That's what it's all about. And that is why many people, Joanna, that have been in the church. Uh, let me tell you one story and then I'll shut up. Um, long, long, long time ago, I had a deacon at our church that passed away. And I could not even do his funeral because he had signed his life over to the Jehovah Witnesses. And I'm not telling you this, Deacon Allen. 
still remember very clearly that when I went to visit this deacon when he was sick, I saw some Jehovah Witness pamphlets on his table. So I said, hey, deacon, what are you doing with this? He said, I didn't want to be, you know, obnoxious or, you know, not friendly to them, so I took their literature. I said, no, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Well, I didn't know he was serious. I didn't even know he'd been studying with them. So, can we have deacons that are also not theologically sound? Yes. I went to seminary with some preachers who are no longer Christians. Because somebody probably pushed them and said, go to seminary, you know? So it's really important for us to understand this. It's important for you to read your Bible every day. Every time you get, before you go to sleep or before you go to work or, you know, whatever. Set some time aside to read it because the Holy Spirit will do in your life what I cannot do. If you're in your word, if you're really in it, reading it and studying it. There's a difference between reading, just reading, and also studying. So they go hand in hand. You look at our Sunday school. You know, not everybody comes to Sunday school. Okay? We also have an opportunity to study together Wednesdays for a cell group. Not everybody goes to cell group. In fact, for some people, at one point uh, in the history of uh, Christianity, people began to think that Sunday school was just for kids. I don't want you to forget what your question is. I was just going to make a comment about what you said, that the Jehovah Witnesses are using the word as, as a sword, but the word of God is, is our sword, and they're doing a better job of studying their word, which is, I, I think, why they're able to convert. Well, they have, they have more discipline than the average evangelical church. Okay, but of course, they're studying the wrong word. Because uh, even a first-year Greek student will know that they're totally off base. Uh, and I don't want to go into their founder and, you know, the history of their founder uh, who really did not even have one semester of Greek and was translating the, uh, uh, the New Testament. I don't consider myself a Greek scholar, even though I teach it, and I've studied it for at least 20, 25 years. Um, I've had one of the best scholars in the world teach me Greek, but I don't consider myself a Greek scholar, and I will never consider myself a translator of the Bible. But this guy didn't even have one semester of Greek, you know, and when they have the tradition that has been passed down, you know, they used to have their Bible green, and people recognized it right away, so they changed the color to black, and uh, now they have it in different colors. They even, I even saw one purple uh, uh, New World Translation. Yes, sir? Oh, do you still have, I know oh, there was a while ago when you, we t you talked about cults. Yes. And you had those charts. I don't know if you still have those. Yeah, I still have them. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know how many I have, but I can have it available for anyone that's interested in them. Any Deacon Allen? Yes. Hold on, hold on. They need to give you my because we're recording it. I think that uh, an answer to uh, her question could be found in John chapter 1. Verses 1 through 14. Okay, whose question are you talking uh, about? Uh, uh, May Marianne. Jo jo oh, Joanna. Yes. Okay. Joanne. And not only that one, but then go to John chapter 3 and see what Jesus told uh, Nicodemus. 
And then the third one would be John 14, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. And I think that would answer the question. Okay, Deacon Allen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, I, this is not just to Joanna, it's to everybody. It's to everybody. You need to understand that when we talk about Christian education, we're not talking about kids. Christian education applies to all of us. All of us. We need to keep studying. I said this in one of my Bible studies, and somebody said, Pastor, you're just, too, you're just being too humble. I said, I am still learning the Bible. Amen. And I'm still learning every day. And uh, I don't even think that I know 20% of it. Okay. If you're talking about, uh, you know, what education people have, having three master's degree in education, in religious education and a doctorate, should, you would think I know everything. Right? No. You know, and that's why we need to keep studying, keep studying. And I was encouraging my cell group class about Bible memorization. Pastor, how do you remember all these verses? Because I go over them over and over and over and over again. I never assume that I know anything. But what I did say, Sister Hazel, <laughs> Well, I, I was serious about not knowing even 20% of it. It's a great book. It's a, it's a book that is old, but it's ever new. Yeah. And in order for you to know, you have to keep studying. And that's why we have to. Uh, one time I was invited to the White House during the Clinton administration. And uh, we went into a room that was full of preachers and lawyers and politicians and leaders in communities. And the guy that was doing the presentation to us came in and held $200 bills. And he said, I'm going to pass this $200 bills around. One of them is real, one of them is fake. I want to see how many of you will guess which one is real and which one is fake. He said, because the way we train our people to recognize the fake is not by showing them characteristics of fake dollar bills. But we show them what the real one is. We teach them how to recognize the real one. And once we teach them to recognize the real one, they know the fake when the fake is given to them. Say, so, so I know you are all preachers and lawyers and doctors and community leaders. He said, but please, I want the $200 bills back because the last group, I gave the bills out, and I got the fake one back. <laughs> yes. I just to ask if I can Okay, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. So you brought up studying again, and we have this in Wednesday night when we're always talking about uh, when we're doing confession, you know, Lord, I haven't been in my word enough. And I know, I mean, I love the word of God. I mean, I like studying. You know, I have friends that I share with. I go to cell. I'm in Bible study. Um, so sometimes it concerns me. Even like when I was reading yesterday, right, I had the day off, so I took time. And, or you do your quiet time. You go for your walks, your meditation. And sometimes, you know, after you read, you just set the Bible down because it's like it just kind of like you need to rest from the Bible reading it. So I was kind of wondering what, what's the concept of um, or what do you think, like, being in our word or studying all the time because my family thinks I study a lot. I don't think I study enough. 
other people don't want to come because they don't want to study at all and or they think just if they just read their bible every so so what's the measurement kind of for that you know because are we really supposed to be reading our bibles 90 percent of the time i mean every single day it just i don't i don't understand i don't, i'm confused okay i think your question is answered by psalm 1 and psalm 119 Okay, and I understand, and I don't want to uh, debate that question because it's very, very debatable. Okay, but all I'm saying to you is that if you don't put in time, the Bible is not absorbed by the process of osmosis. You really have to read it yourself. You really have to study it yourself. And I jokingly said one time, and I meant it, for some people, if you want to hide money from them, put it in a Bible. David did that. Okay. <laughs> That's not fair. I have three Bibles. <laughs> But it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a very important thing. You know, it's a very important thing. That's, uh, not reading the Bible is like going on a diet of, I don't want to eat. Well, maybe it's hunger strike, you know, more like a diet. It's hunger strike. I understand the importance of reading the Bible, and it's not necessarily for me. I'm just, it, it always strikes me or it bothers me when I hear people confessing, Lord, I haven't, you know, forgive me for watching TV more than I spent time with you or forgive me for putting other things before you. And, and I know that there's extremes to everything, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. But for those people that, like, don't come to Sunday school or don't come because they're afraid that they're, you know, going to be accused of not reading their Bible enough or that it's something they have to do every single day, um, you know, 24 hours a day. How, how do you, it's, it's about how, I mean, you have a love for the word once, you know, and when you know who God is, you want to know more about him. So I get that yeah. part and hiding his word in your heart and meditating on it. But there's so many different ways to do that. It doesn't necessarily always have to be so confined to just you know, what people might interpret is I have to read my Bible or I have to be studying this every single day, 24 hours a day. So I don't know. I was just wondering if well, you Well, it is better it. that way. 24 hours a day? What? If you have 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't want to go to sleep or whatever. You know, um, you can never overread your Bible. You can never overread your Bible. Uh, it's... It's essential that every opportunity you get that you study the Bible. And I don't get it when somebody says, I love him, but I don't want to spend time with him. That's a bunch of crap. You know, if you, if you say you love me, you want to spend time with me. If you say you love the word, but you don't want to spend time with the word, you're just lying. Or you're deceiving yourself. Uh, I'm just I mean, but you don't have a husband, no, though. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question not related to what we're talking about right now. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> you want to yeah. change this Helping subject? You out, Rosin. <laughs> Helping you out right now. Recognize. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had um, a preacher come in and talk about food. You can't hear me? Oh. No, they couldn't hear you. So okay. speak into the mic. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Um, 
couple weeks ago we had a, a preacher that came and talked about health and food and um <clears throat> i left kind of discouraged uh only because i guess i interpreted as um eating food is kind of a sin like if you overeat it's kind of a sin yes it is so i mean <clears throat> what is, what's considered overeating i mean because every now and again i like to take down a rack of ribs yeah 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 i just well, you're not alone can you see this <laughs> But I don't want to end up feeling guilty because I, you know, felt like eating a rack of ribs. Yeah. But basically, I think her message. Are you done? Yes. Okay. I think her message is this. I just hired a trainer. I'm going to the gym now. Okay. I'm trying to take care of the body. And I'm eating right now. I write down everything I eat. I count the calories. I'm looking at that because uh, that wasn't, that did not start from the Wanda Dickerson that preached for us here. It started from uh, Makila. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. That challenged me. You need to eat healthy, you need to exercise. And I asked her to do a healthy living ministry for our church. Okay, I think that we have to practice what we preach. Okay, if I say to you that you need to read your Bible and you need to obey it, and I'm not reading and obeying it, then I'm a hypocrite. And I think just because your fault is pointed out does not mean you're condemned unless you want to stay in your fault. So, is it sin to gossip? Yes. If the preacher preaches and you feel bad, the preacher has done his or her job. Now, you do yours with the Holy Spirit living in you and helping you. That's why the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it is important that when you hear a message and it touches your heart, it's not going to touch it like, oh, love, I love you. (laughs) Okay? Sometimes it's going to be like you're cursing the preacher as you go out. But you go home, you read that Bible again. And say, was it the preacher talking to you or was it the Holy Spirit talking to you? And then you know you're supposed to change. If you're on the phone 24 hours a day gossiping, then you cut it down to 10. <laughs> Until you hear the next message, right? <laughs> it, it shows that you're open to the word and you're correcting what needed to be corrected. Amen. Okay? Uh, Believe me, I was not in your bedroom. I was not seeing everything that was happening, but God was. So when God uses that to convict you, it's your responsibility to respond to the Holy Spirit and say, yes, okay, 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 okay. Time out. I hear you. Please give me strength to be able to do this. Because you know it's not right. And, And, you know, so... It's not, like I always tell you, I'm just a delivery boy, right? Don't hold me responsible because the message belongs to God. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Any other follow-up question? Okay. I don't think we're going to get to what I have prepared. So I'm going to give this to the ushers. Uh, Brother Mark, can you come up? And as you go out, even though I'm still going to do this one more time, we'll go through this uh, as many people as they go out. Don't hand it out now. As they go out. And if somebody says, I don't want it, don't give it to them. 
Okay. Uh, so next time we're going to talk about the five principles of Christian stewardship. That I just started it the last time, but we're going to uh, make sure. But I want you to look at them, maybe start studying them uh, as we go. Um, and let me also thank uh, Gina. Uh, some things that I've handed out to you have been designed by Gina. Uh, I will work out the details and I say, hey, Gina, can you put this in something so people won't throw it away? You know, so uh, uh, she does that very good. So that's what you, amen. Thank you.